Well, hello everybody, this is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number uh, 238. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, today's guest is Jose Edmundo Ocampo Reyes. He'll be here in about five minutes. But before we get to say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been a continuous publication since 995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this. We love poetry, and now we do too. So please do click the like button and share. Make sure you're subscribed. Ring the bell for notifications. Anything you can do to help spread poetry around the internet would be much appreciated. Um, sorry for the bit of a delayed start. I made the mistake of clicking yes to update my software before I uh, <laughs> went into uh, OBS, and it changed a whole bunch of things and took longer than I thought. And it's hard to like see everything right now. I'm trying to move around all my panels and control knobs as we go. Hopefully uh, the, the show won't be glitchy because of that. But um, we're going to start out like we always do with our uh, Poet Respond poem. And the poet couldn't make it tonight, but Pamela Manasco was Sunday's poet. She had a really interesting Abbasidarian poem, which is something we don't see very often. We publish a few of them, but I don't know, not all that many. It's not a common form. Um, and it was about um, a situation in the libraries in Alabama. So I'll, hear, I'll read uh, what she had to say first, then we'll have her read the poem. Uh, she says, uh, this is Pamela Manasco, This poem responds to the recent firing of several employees at a Prattville, Alabama library, which itself is related to the recent decision of the Alabama Senate to pass SB 10, a bill which allows local city councils to fire library board members. After Prattville Library Director Andrew Foster publicly shared emails from a board member who requested that some juvenile library materials be removed or removed from the library, Foster was fired without the Board of Trustees providing information about which library rule he supposedly violated. Uh, later, four librarians closed the library in response to the firing, and they were also fired. It's a messy story and a scary one, which shows the future of Alabama's Republican government members want remove any library material which violates Alabama values, and good luck finding a definition for those, by the way, and fire anyone who disagrees. So really interesting story going on in Alabama right now, and this is Pamela Manasco's poem, Abbasidarian for Alabama Library. So sit back and, and take a listen to this. ABC Darien for Alabama Libraries Alder to Ash What can be sacrificed, boned, defanged, let it be. Burn it to cinders to keep children civil. Don't end until not only paper is extinguished, but cards and computers too. Florida can't win this heat. Don't forget gardens, sensory, learning, the kids tracked. Hay mulched over marigold seeds in the beds too early, and inside, juried tables of books for belonging. Keep matches to snuff out even labels, hands that write, seed-like ideas. Maybe then it will be enough. Never fix the broken-down bridge over Selma, unwalkable routes to food pantries, potholes blowing tires, unfeeling, quiet. Never pay the school lunch debts rolling month to month. Why must we feed starving children? Make sure they're born. That's your job done. Do all in your power until you have it all. So we look back with vertigo at everything you took from us with white noise. Don't pay for college, for Xanax, for unkillable hospital bills. And years from now, we will not be 50th, but zero, praying daily at your altar. Here's the problem. So I had it on mute because I can't see all the things. Anyway, that was a Sunday's poem uh, by Pamela Manasco, Abbasidarian for Alabama Libraries. And... Um, and if you'd like to share uh, any news poems, keep poetry relevant by submit them to uh, rattle.com slash respond is where to go. Any poems about current events, uh, we love to share and publish on Sundays. That was Pamela's poem. And uh, now sit tight and right where you are. And I'll be back in just a minute with uh, Jose, um, uh, Jose Edmando Ocampo Reyes. I'll just be right back. Uh, so sit right where you are.
And we're back. Thanks for your patience. Now, like I said, today's guest is uh, Jose Edmundo Ocampo Reyes, the author of the chapbook Present Values from Backbone Press in 2018, which was just re-released as an ebook, so you can buy that now. Um, he's winner of the Jean Patrick Chapik Award from the New England Poetry Club. His poems have previously appeared in various Philippine and U.S. journals and have been anthologized in the Powell River Anthology, Villanelles, the Archive of the Mastery of Filipino Poetry and Verse from English, um, and No Tender Fences, an anthology of immigrant and first-generation American poetry. You can find the chapbook at backbonepress.org. And here he is, uh, Jody. Hey, Jody, how you doing? Good, Tim. Good to finally meet you. Yeah, it is so great to meet you in person. You're one of those intriguing poets, I think, that I've, you know, there's some poets that they don't publish a lot. Um, you know, they're not all over the place, but when they do, there's such interesting, unusual poems. There's a lot of technical form going on in your poems and a lot of really unusual topics, too. Uh, so it's really fun. I've wanted to have you on for a long time. It's great to have you here. Um, likewise, Tim, and I thank you for the comment. I really appreciate it. Uh, let's start out with a poem right off the bat. Um, do you want to read Instructions to Travelers from the Third World? Sure. Instructions to Travelers from the Third World. Before you cross the border, you must learn how to use your passport, the sine qua non of any voyage. Guard it as your life. You must not lose your passport. Your photo may adorn it, but it really is the property of your crumbling republic as you are. It is a crime to alter or reproduce your passport. Peculiar to you as your shadow, your fingerprint, your double helix, it is neither carte blanche nor diary of hopes. Don't abuse your passport. You dream of glimpsing snow, cathedrals, fist-sized diamonds plundered from your land. First, you must queue for hours in the sun, wait for the consul to peruse your passport. When he slams down his crimson stamp like a gavel and you walk home, dusting off your shame, how easy it will be to accuse your passport. But it is guiltless as a tortured root that causes you to trip and break a bone. Blame instead your fellow terrorists and refugees and excuse your passport. Think you can sneak by without a visa, feign ignorance, charm the immigration officer with your strange locution? Your scheme will boomerang once he views your passport. Your name, the theorems you've proved, your cancer cure are of no consequence. It's pages blighted fields. Your passport is your world. You cannot choose your passport. Yeah, so a beautiful guzzle there. And as most people know, watching, we have a uh, guzzle tribute issue coming up um, in the summer, which is going to be a lot of fun, but a great example of a perfectly done guzzle there. Um, and which is always, I mean, that's the main thing that I that at first attracted your poetry by is your use of form. Can you talk a little bit about about what drew you to becoming a formal poet and, and why you, you feel um, that, that, that writing in with structure is, is the direction to go? Um, oh, <laughs> that, that's a good question. Um, so I, um, I guess, the, so there's a part of me that's really drawn to structure. Um, and when I was uh, deciding on what to major, I know this goes a little way back, but when I was deciding on what to major for college, um, I knew I was good at math. Um, I'm attracted to math, um, but I also have a passion for literature. Uh, Ray Bradbury was one of my early loves. And so um, I wound up choosing, uh, I guess, a math-related degree. Um, and my first career, well, one of my first careers was finance. So um, I, I guess I have that natural inclination um, towards structure. Um, and uh, well, as a side note, piece of trivia, um, poetry used to be called numbers. <laughs> Um, that, that's an interesting fact that I, I am really attracted to. Um, and so I, you know, I, well, I, I, I guess it's a natural inclination of mine. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. That answers sort of two of the questions I had, uh, maybe for the future, but I was always wondered if you had a mathematics background and if you had a finance background, because that comes up so much as metaphor 
um, in this chat book and, and other work I've seen of yours. Um, but but tell me about that about po- uh, numbers were poetry. I've never heard that before. Can you can you elaborate on that? That's interesting. Um, and and so uh, Alexander Pope um, in one of his um, poems uh, he has this. He has this couple. Uh, he has this line. Um, I list the numbers for the numbers came, and I think Milton refers to um, when he when he uh, writes Paradise Lost. He's uh, he's calling on the muse, um, and he refers to uh, numbers yet unheard. So I, I think et- etymologically, um, it has that close relation to poetry. And I think originally, um, much of English language poetry was numbered in the sense that you counted syllables you counted beats um so i i think so i think that's kind of gone a little bit by the wayside mm-hmm. but um yeah i i i discovered that in in grad school well it's very interesting to to think about um the the relationship between poetry and math because you know, music is math and notes and harmony um, are all, you know, frequencies and the way they overlap. And as we move through musical poems, uh, that's that's the same kind of thing. I don't know. No one's ever sort of mapped it out like you would sheet music and structured things phonetically. Um, it's sort of too complicated to do, maybe. Um, but I can really easily imagine a sort of visualizing in you know, graphs and maps, the way that sounds are moving around in the mouth of the poet as they speak and the way that patterns are repeating and establishing, um, you know, a certain relationship in a certain set of data and then manipulating itself within that closed set. You know, so there's a lot of math involved in poetry, even though it's it's intuitive in so many levels and so many ways that we don't really think much about it. Um, so do you, do you um, find form like that the the mathematical nature of it um is that the reason why that that you that you write in the form um i i think that's part of it um when you know, when i was i guess starting to write as a poet um like some of my mentors would encourage me to um write in lines that were roughly the same length <laughs> um and it's become a habit to the point where I kind of sometimes want to push against that. Um, as you may know, I, I'm part of the Powell River Poets. Um, I, when I moved to Massachusetts, I sought out the community and uh, Rena Espayot, um, whom I've known for about two decades, um, you know, welcomed me into the group. So there, there was that, um, I guess, affinity with the work that they, that they do. Um, and, and, you know, there's something about symmetry, uh, but it, it's tr- trying to find that balance. You know, you don't want to be too mechanical. And I think a lot of my poems where, um, the, I guess the, the form uses me rather than I using the form. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's where things kind of fall apart, but it, it's finding that, uh, the, the tension and trying to navigate that. So, um, Let's see. Let's uh, let's read another poem. Um, the defaulting is up next. Defaulting. A hedge fund lifts the proverbial gun to a de facto thief's head, bent on retrieving tomorrow's gains. Past audits flaunted in the Fed's face. Markets, their lungs tinged with the flu ignoring red flags. Angels lunch with vultures at the first floor deli. We're all adults here. The restructuring plan has been ding, 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 a mock epic fail. Regrets past due. I had as lief not be as live to be in debt to such a thing as I myself. Yields fall all day while losses mount past the final ring. And so that was defaulting. One of the many poems in Present Values that um, that has those those finance metaphors. And I was wondering, you know, reading the book and reading your work in the past, uh, other poems that we've read, if you had that kind of background. Tell us a little bit about how how you um, you know moved through the different careers you've had. What was it that drew you to poetry, and how did you shift away from from finance? Um, actually, I started out as a poet. I think, like mm-hmm. in 
in um in college in the 90s i i'm dating myself <laughs> um so i decided to major in i guess the equivalent here in the u.s would be um industrial engineering or industrial management engineering um so there was a lot of math calculus statistics um but i was heavily involved with the school literary journal um i i was an avid reader so i was trying to um i was trying to maintain that love for literature and and nurture it um and you know what my my first job i taught for a year in my alma mater um and then i decided you know what i i really need to um experience the world so i i worked in finance for five years um and then i i always knew i wanted to go back to literature maybe pursue a master's an mfa and so um maybe a maybe sometime around 1999 2000 i applied to a couple of mfa programs here in the us and before i got an acceptance i quit my job i said you know if you know if like uh, if i act as though the universe uh, if i act as though i uh, if get an acceptance the universe will grant it to me mm -hmm. and um so i i applied to six programs got into one Wow. What did it feel like to put, you know, everything out there and just take the leap like that? Was there any um, anxiety about doing that or? Uh... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yes. But um, yeah. And, you know, it all worked out. Um, but yeah, I, I guess somehow, you know, I like the, the mathematical side, the literary side, I, I think the the conventional wisdom is, you know, they're two separate worlds. But for me, I, I've never really thought them as diametrically opposite, like maybe in tension with each other. Um, but, you know, I, I like they're, they're part of who I am. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us about you know, because the, the chapbook is so full of great metaphors from the financial sector. Uh, which is not something you see very often um, in poems. It's it, it's one of the things. Think, the language is really ripe for using uh, metaphorically and, and symbolically, and yet it's not something that we're. It's not an avenue where poets often live, and so it's a rare that we pull from those things. So so tell us about present values as the title for the book. What that means financially, and, and why that's an overarching metaphor for for the whole collection. So. Um... The, the concept of present value, uh, it's a foundational concept in finance. Um, it's the idea that uh, the value of any financial asset, and I apologize if this is a little technical, but the value of any financial asset uh, is a function of its future cash flows. Um, so like if you have bonds or, or, or stocks or whatever, in theory, uh, the value of those assets is a function of how much money you will receive from them in the future uh and so i um one of the i guess intersecting ideas so i'm from the philippines and um when you know when i came here to the u.s i was i shouldn't have been i guess but i was i was shocked by how uh little space the philippines had in the united states uh, historical consciousness Mm -hmm. So um, I, I thought about that and how, well, if, if the present value of an asset is a function of the value of its future cash flows, then by implication, the past value doesn't matter at all, uh, the historical. So mm -hmm. so you have you know, different companies that have been worth millions, billions of dollars and then in the past, but because of uh, excessive debt or whatever, they're bankrupt now. So, so in a way, the present value is zero. So it didn't matter that they were worth billions of dollars in the past. Um, and so I, I, I thought that was a that was a metaphor for, I guess, how like how the the United States as a country kind of tends to diminish some certain things or certain um relationships that it's had in the past so the united states in our textbooks takes up about half the half the 
have the textbook, but we're lucky if the Philippines takes even a paragraph in a in a U.S. textbook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's it's just a great it is a great metaphor um, for the collection as a whole. Uh, let's hear another poem. I will think I will read. I'll read Boondocks. Boondocks. It begins with an epigraph. According to the 2002 Encyclopedia Britannica Book of the Year, the Philippines has the fourth largest population of English speakers in the world, ranking after the United States, India, and the United Kingdom. To show our appreciation for your gift of language, we'd like to offer you one word of our own, Pundok, which means mountain. It may not slide as smoothly off your tongue as the French montagne, but we hope nonetheless your lexicon can accommodate this term, which has been blessed by the goddess who scatters ginger along Makiling slopes. Keep it as a souvenir of the times we fought side by side when the Japanese hunted us down in the Cordilleras, and let your poets repeat it when they recount those still unnamed battles in their slim volumes. Remember to say the word out loud for luck before you leave our shores, your frigates full of timber, siblings, gold. Yeah, another beautiful poem that was Boondocks. Um, by Jose Edmundo Ocampo Reyes. And, and you can see there what I always love about your work, which is how much you can learn um, from your, your poems. I mean, every time I come across your poem anywhere, I learn something new, it seems like, or many new things, or find new things to look up that I didn't know about. How much, how much research goes into the poems that you write? A poem like this, um, Boondocks, which I didn't, I didn't know the etymology from there, is, is that you... you um, um, you know, found those facts and then and then wrote the poem out. How how much, you know, what is your writing process like when it comes to researching and finding new content? Or is it that you read so widely that, that all of this uh, information is up there all the time? Um, so for this particular poem, I, I wouldn't call it research. I mean, th this is something that I knew from um, like from living and growing up in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, like, I, I knew that, okay, in the United States, boondocks meant this, and it came from boondock. And I think there are other, there are other, um, a small number of words with, uh, Tagalog or Filipino etymology, like yo-yo, mm -hmm. um, for instance. So, so in, in this particular case, um, it was, it was simply a matter of, I guess, drawing from my own knowledge, my own experience. But um, in in other cases, like um, I, I've recently been uh, tapping into, I guess, um, the history of the Philippine American War. So like that, I've been digging into a, a bunch of historical documents. Um, but you know, for for this particular poem, it was it was more drawing on um, what I already knew and kind of I guess what made what made this something I wouldn't have written when I was in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I I would I would never have thought of this, but I guess it was the experience of navigating that I guess asymmetrical relationship between the U.S. and the Philippines. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and. You know, it is like like you say in the epigraph. It's the fourth largest English speaking population in the world. We had a um, tribute to Filipino poets issue um, way back in two thousand six, I think it was. It is f full of wonderful poems and, and poets. Um, what is the state? You know, the state of poetry there in the Philippines. Um, how much is poetry read? How much is it part of the culture? Um, and 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 are, is is the group of poets right now? writing in English a lot of the time or, or um, Tagalog or what? Um, so I, I think, I think they're different. They're, they're, they're multiple communities. So we have multiple languages in the Philippines. Um, I, I grew up in Metro, in the greater Metro Manila area. Um, and 
I grew up speaking English. There, there's uh, there are several terrific um, Filipino poets writing in English, but there are also several who are terrific writing in Filipino, Tagalog, uh, and the different languages. Um, most of whom I I can't really um, read or speak. Um, but you know, it's you know there there's there's a lot actually even the Philippines a lot of writing that I'm still learning about myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's it's such a rich um, you know and, and and large population, and so it's it's really fascinating. Anytime you can look, look at how poetry is treated in other places. Um, let's see. Let's do uh, the next poem up. Um, what, what do you want to read next? Oh, um, let's see. You can read the title poem. Oh, great! Yeah. Present values. From their towers, little gods wage wars, deploying their red currencies. Mine, yours, couched in possession, each retort enlarges a world, constricts another. Still no sign of wreckage, save the wind, which rumors new casualties with each cold stab. Above constellations of insomniac windows, Arbitrageur, hand poised to level his skewed balance. Speculator, eyes wholly invested in the future. O earth, O mort main, of what use it is, of what use is it to place our trust in the Argentine stars when it is the dark that will endure, minting more and more of itself like the emperor's new coins? And that was present values, the title poem to uh, Jose's chapbook. Um, and what can you tell us, uh, Jose, about your uh, writing process? Um, you know, how often do you write? You know, are you a regular writing poet um, or are you infrequently as the inspiration hits? And then when you sit down to confront that page, um, how do you start out a poem? What What is your process like? Um, well, so I, I write more infrequently than I should. Um, I, I, I do want to make it a more regular practice um, for for a poem like this one. Um, like it, sometimes it's that image like that that comes to mind. Um, for a poem like "Defaulting," and I know we like that was a few poems ago, but uh, sometimes you know I'll experiment. I I for "Defaulting," I took the the word "defaulting." And I ran it through an anagram generator <laughs> and tried to, you know, try to see, you know, what what words, what constellations of words would come up, and then just try to try to um, see see resonances and and conversations between them. Um, and the the thing I found with a with that was because you're using similar um, similar sounds, similar vowels and consonants you're going to wind up with a lot of internal rhyme and assonance and, and all that. And so it's it's about finding I finding those pathways through sound. That's that's one way. Um for for something like present values, it was drawing on my experience and like the uh, you know, I remember I, I lived in Hong Kong for a while, you know, looking uh, walking the streets at night on the weekends and seeing those, uh, so seeing those tall buildings and in you know, office, uh, of, uh, offices lit up almost randomly like constellations. So, um, like sometimes it's an image, sometimes sometimes it's sound. Um, yeah. And then, so so when you have that, how how much you know? Because your poems are so packed um, and rich, um, th there's a density to the the work that you're writing. Um, is a lot of that in the revision process? Is it honing and honing down, um, and and expanding and adding new metaphors and getting it more and more condensed as you go? Oh, oh, absolutely. I, I write terrible first drafts, <laughs> and and that's that's often the biggest obstacle. And it's it's just persevering through that, um, and. Sometimes it, it helps to have that writing group or that trusted reader to um, help, you know, once once you've gotten into a point where, okay, maybe I can show this to other people. Um, 
the feedback is very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and so tell us now, since you already mentioned the Pow Wow River Poets, which is really, I mean, one of the reasons why I want to have you on is I love the Pow Wow River Poets group. I mean, Rena's been on before, and she's one of my favorite poets. And I love, as people know, formal poetry, and they lean formal in that group. Um, so, so what is your, your experience with that group? And you said, you know, you've known Rena for 20 years. Um, what has it been like to be a part of that group and, and what have you learned from it? If you could, you know, summarize in some way. Um, so I, I've known, so I've known Rena for about 20, 20 odd years. And, uh, like I, I actually haven't been going to their workshops as frequently as, as, uh, as I used to, um, once my kid, once my kids came, and I, I've moved farther and farther from uh, Newburyport, where they're where they're based. But um, it it's really inspiring to see the the level of work that they produce consistently, and and in a way, it's almost daunting. But it's also, gosh, you know, I, this is something I aspire toward. Um, a lot of the times with with formal verse, uh, it can feel very stilted, and and that's really not the case um, with with uh, the work of someone like Rena. Uh, and it's you know trying to it, it's I guess writing formal verse in the twenty first century. It's like you have to keep making it new, and um, you know I've I've learned from them. You know maybe maybe um something i've written feels a little unnatural or feel feels a little off and and it you know it's back to the drawing board or um when when i write something that meets their approval then then i'm like okay yes this is probably worth sending out to uh to a journal was there any you know piece of advice because they do i i'm not really sure how it operates i assume it's like a workshop type setting where you present new work and they'd critique and talk about it uh, was there any advice or suggestion that they gave that you found yourself you know repeating and, and learning from so now that you have that sort of voice in the back of the head about what they would say for certain poems is, is that your experience and, and what is the advice if so that that's the most common thing they would say when you were earlier on before you started developing um i don't know that there was any specific um advice or uh, any any uh, i guess generalized statement that uh, generalized lesson that i i take with me a lot of it was very poem was very poem specific um but it's it's just the the company of, of in people who have the same love of poetry as as I do, and you know being able to have that space um, one Saturday morning a month. Um, it's gone virtual now. Well, actually, technically it's hybrid now. <laughs> they they've gone they, when when COVID came, they went to an online format, and now it's I understand it or. I, it's not that I understand. I, I know it's gone um hybrid, but um, you know, some of some of the poems in present values I I I've workshopped with them and they've helped make make them better. Mm -hmm. Um let's hear uh, the next poem. Uh, what do you want to read next? Um let's see. Well, we can do we can do the one um that you selected for poets respond. Systemic functional linguistics. History is who did what to whom expressed in nominal and verbal groups. The clause conveys the meanings we assume. The circumstances vary in covert rooms beyond the border wall aboard the sloops of war. We speak of who did what to whom, participants and processes. The theme orients us to the message, to the new. The loss conveys the meaning. We assume the purpose shapes the grammar, ends drive means. We must strike down this evil at its roots. History is who did what to whom, 
who may respond become a who that names losses they can and must and will recoup. The clause conveys the meanings we assume, and truth lies in the words we all consume. We killed because they killed our troops. History is who did what to whom. The clause conveys the meanings we assume. Yeah, that is such a fascinating poem. And that line, you know, the 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 refrain in the Villanelle, history is who did what to whom. And thinking of it that way is one of those lines that stuck with me for such a long time since we published it. Um, what can you tell about system, system, systemic functional linguistics? It's a very complicated topic. I remember when uh, you sent this poem and I tried to learn a little bit more about it just to understand. And, and it was, um, you know, over my head as a you know, non-technical linguistic type person. Um, what can you tell us about that and, and how, oh. how you came up with combining these two topics um, in this poem? It's, it's one of the many, many interesting you know, subject matters that you touch on in, in, this, in this book. Um, so I, I work in education and um, like I, I recently completed my my doctorate uh, and um, one of my areas of interest is literacy and um, and um, systemic functional linguistics and even even up to now I'm still trying to figure out because it, it's very it's very dense and complex all the all the work but um, simply put it's it's really about how language works, uh, like it's it's a theory of how language works and how um, when we think about grammar, um, the stereotypical way grammar is taught in school is it's about you know following all these rules and if you if you make a mistake, you know you, your essay gets marked with the, with uh, in red and all that. Um, so uh, I'll use the acronym SFL. So F SFL practitioners are more interested i think um not so much in grammar as a set of rules but as a set of tools to do different things um and so paradoxically um i i hated history in high school because it was taught as memorization um memorizing names dates and all that but um as part of my research into sfl uh, I discovered that uh, so different different uh, subjects have different grammatical DNA, hmm. and so for instance, history textbooks. If you if you break them down to their mo to their most basic, they're fundamentally about who um, with who did what to whom, and in SFL lingo, that those are um, essentially participants and processes. So um, that was very much on my mind uh, when, um, when uh, I believe it was January of 2020. Uh, I think there was a um, there was a drone strike or an assassination of a of an Iraqi um, military official, and I, I was just thinking, you know, this there's this never ending cycle of um, revenge that uh, really saddened me. Um, and kind of parallel to that, this idea of how when we, you know, when we tell our histories, like it, it, it's always kind of uh, the good guys and the and the bad guys, or the good, the good girls and the bad girls. Um, and and so, you know, I tried to I tried to synthesize all of that into this poem, and I I think once I found the refrains, um, it it became fairly. Um, fairly straightforward. I know. You, I think you essentially have a week to to write these things for um, for poets respond. And so I was I was lucky to be able to um, find, I guess, some like make some connections between them, and um, and that you liked it. Yes. Um, yeah, it definitely did. And it's a poem, you know, sadly that that's relevant all the time, you know, especially in the last six months as, you know, Israeli and Gaza and, um, you know, the war in Ukraine, it, you know, just that the, that line kind of repeats through as a, you know, as a callback. A, a lot of times watching the news for me since reading that poem for the first time um, about SFL, that systemic functional linguistics. Are there ways that that applies to poetry? There, there's a way that you know, what What we're looking for in poems, I always feel like, is a kind of honesty. 
like a kind of authenticity in, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but you can sort of hear when a poet is like hitting on something. And it has something to do with the grammar, I think. Um, I did an interview with James Pennebaker, the psychologist um, who wrote the book, The Secret Life Pronouns. And he can use, you know, pronoun use to determine, um, you know, how honest someone is being. And that seems in a way that there's this weird way I've never been able to grasp that, that what you're listening for in a poem and what's like resonating with us, because the grammar, I think, is subconscious, we re respond to the music of that being authentic into something that I can't quite understand. But is SFL related to that in some way that you can explain or think about? Um, I'm I'm pretty sure it is. So I, um, I I know that there are SFL practitioners out there, and one of my uh, good friends, um, I don't know if she's listening, Doctor Brixie Tan Cruz, um, who teaches at my alma mater in the Philippines and who introduced me to this um, this world. Um, I know that she applies SFL principles to teaching literature. Mm -hmm. um, like my, I guess my my um, research interest is mainly on the, uh, I guess, the disciplinary literacy side, how how history texts are different from science texts and are different from literary texts. Mm -hmm. And um, the like, they're all literacy, but every discipline has its own literacy and, and its own, I guess, grammatical DNA. Uh, and so by teaching students how you know how the DNA of that particular field works. Uh, it makes things more easily graspable. Mm -hmm. um, so I I think I think yes. The the short answer is yes, definitely. Um, you can apply an SFL lens to the studying poetry and literature. So is um is there a certain grammatical DNA to poetry? Um, is there something in the way that there is for history, like you mentioned that poem? Um, is there something that, that poems tend to have in common? Um, th that's a good question. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I, I think it's a I, th I think there's some rules of thumb that, that you can probably, um, the, that you can probably, um, uh, talk about. So, um, like a lot of these, a lot of these elements, uh, you, like the image, for instance, um, which you know, it's um, I, I wouldn't exactly say it's the sine qua non of poetry, but it's it's very it, it's very close. And you know, images are often, um, I guess, from a grammatical perspective, probably have a noun component, <laughs> um, probably have a probably have an adjective component, and and it's the interaction between the two. Um, we're we're always taught to I guess be be concrete, use active rather than passive mm -hmm. verbs. Although passive verbs will have their will have their function, um, so I, I think it I think it's really about you know what effects the poet is trying to do, and you know someone like like someone like Rina Espayat, for instance, will will approach writing a sonnet differently. From someone say like Karen Volkman mm -hmm. um, or Joyelle Maxwini. So, um, I so I I think I think there's certain you know I'll, I'll have to think about that <laughs> some more. Um, but yeah, yeah. Well, it is a topic that always interests me. But one of the things I think about a lot is the way in the rise of you know poetry becoming academic and there being MFA programs and a lot of sophistication about the way we write. We've unlocked a lot of ways in which storytelling can sort of be perfected. You know, you mentioned using concrete images. That's just not some random convention. Um, that's a way to implant a story in someone else's mind while you're telling it that, that makes them feel more strongly. You know, and so there's sort of these, these tools that we've developed through um, understanding how writing is affected on, you know, readers affected by writing. And it, it seems like, like um, you know, that, that ties in, I think, in a way that seems unexplored with systemic functional linguistics, which is why, one of the reasons why that poem is fascinating. Otherwise, other, other than just being a beautiful villanelle, um, it's a really interesting topic, too, for poets to address. Um, well, well, let's uh, let's hear the next poem up. There's a, several we haven't heard yet. Um, I can read 
self-portrait as a derivatives trader. And this one has an epigraph uh, from John Keats' letter to Richard Woodhouse, 27 October, 1818. Poetical character does no harm from its, its relish of the dark side of things any more than from its taste for the bright one, because they both end in speculation. One, I speculate on the magnitude and direction of other speculations, derive my profit from another's loss. I structure assets from assets, alchemize compounds from every possible periodic table, periodic table of the bonds, junk bonds, convertibles, samurais, kiwis, tips, periodic table of the stocks, Alibaba, Chevron, Daimler, Travelers, AstraZeneca. Periodic table of the indices, Putsi, Ovespa, Nikkei, Hang Seng, Bolsa. Periodic table of the currencies, Baht, Euro, Ruble, Ringgit, Rivnia, Dinar. Periodic table of the commodities, Copper, Coffee, Orange Juice, Lumber, Rice, Hogs. Elements that outnumber and outglitter the stars. Two, call, put, forward, swap. Out of these simple financial machines, I make things, construct boxes that nest boxes like words defined by words defined by words, stratagems to hedge my position, apply leverage to leverage to topple a country's currency peg or sell in a shadow market that dwarfs the largest bazaar the mind can conceive, to whose barcon-shaped rhythms and syntax I am attuned. Where there is stillness, I sow volatility. Where there is fear, cold resolve. I reflect on my screens, world simulacra, where headlines march relentlessly, expendable platoons, and prices fluctuate like populations promiscuous, and ultimately doomed. Yeah, that's another great poem. That was a self-portrait as a derivatives trader that was read uh, by Major Jackson on the slowdown. And I love that choice by him too. There's something about the language. It reminds me a lot of um, Shirt, the Robert Pinsky turning all that beautiful language from the garment industry into poetry because there's just anytime there's a rich lexicon like that um it's just beautiful to hear all the sounds of those words that it once you know you've sort of heard but don't really know what they mean they sound kind of um there's just something really just beautiful about language itself and there's such a rich vocabulary within that financial sector that you hardly ever hear and we have one poem about alan greenspan that i love um, by tony tragilio um, but there's just so few poems of that topic uh, what was it your experience like um in that financial sector and and how much of that um what did you learn from that i'm just curious about it in general um so you'd think that I'd be a terrific investor by now, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know it. Uh, I guess th there's something um, I guess competitive, or th there there's this like it it's all about profit and loss. Um, there there's that there's that part that there there's that part that there's the business side, um, but you're also like you're also. Um, dealing with individuals, I guess. Yeah, like you're you're in the same trading floor with people who have their own their own stories, their own interests, their own backgrounds. And you know, once in a while, like over time, you 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 do get to know them a bit. Um, so in, in a way, it's it's um, antithetical <laughs> to I guess the 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 the, the life most poets lead um but you know there's also that energy there's also that um i, I guess you, you can't escape it like it 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 gives you a it gives you a, a glimpse into the um the the plumbing <laughs> that that uh, of the monetary and financial systems that you know we like th there might be some things that i guess my um we might find you know oh we don't want to deal with that there's that cutthroat environment um and yet we can't escape it. we can't escape the like 
dealing with money, uh, dealing with finances. Mm -hmm. did, did you find that, um, you know, conducive to writing poetry? Like, was it the kind of thing where, you know, because you're using a certain part of your brain all day working in that field, then you're, it's refreshing and like an escape to write at night? Or was it the kind of uh, job that, that really pushed you into surprising places with the poetry? Because that sort of seems like my experience when you're doing things that are not poetry related all the time. You know, it's like a meditative, refreshing or exercise or something that, that you sort of your body needs some kind of sense of movement. If you've been sitting in a chair all day, that kind of thing. And then you want to go and you go write a poem because it's um, so different than what you're doing by day. Did you find that? I, I think while I was working in finance, like poetry became this aspirational thing. And there there was a part of me that didn't really think like at the, while I was living that um, career, um, poetry was this thing that I longed for. It, it was this thing. So it was this thing out there. And you know, when, when, like, when the end of the day came, I just wanted to leave all of this behind. But years later, decades later, um, I found it was something that I could tap into, mm -hmm. and 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 draw draw from. Um, and you know, in the case of this poem in particular. I like, so I, I worked with derivatives, um, which are financial instruments whose value depends on, on underlying instruments like bonds, stocks, and all that. And, and they got a bad rap. Um, like, like in a way, derivatives were at the heart of the financial crisis in, in 08. Um, Warren Buffett called them financial weapons of mass destruction. Um, but then, you know, I one day I, I happened to be thinking of like I was thinking of Keats's letter and elsewhere in that letter, he, he talks about how a poet has no identity and he derives his identity from from other things, uh, as I'm paraphrasing there. But I thought, you know, that's just like that's just like what I used to do <laughs> um, that, or like um, that that reminded me of. The, the life that I I used to live, and so you know I, I was able to tap into it. Mm -hmm. um, is there something you know? Just wondering about the derivatives trade. Um, is there some positive to it? Like you mentioned, everything being cutthroat. Is it like a skim, or is there some function that that serves somebody that we just don't quite understand? You know, there's there's ways like I think about how. Um, you know, certain things like like rent and the idea that like there's a sort of common idea that rent seeking is something that's really just negative. And yet, you know, having not having to put up the capital to to buy the storefront or whatever that you're working on, there's real value in that. It helps move the economy and have money circulating so we can have economic movement, which creates, um, you know, prosperity in a lot of ways. Is there something like that in the derivatives trade that that's good or is it just like how can we you know edge a little bit off of the skim a little bit off the top in the process of, of things um I, I think it's a little of both i think that um like there are like there are commodity producers for instance who who will want to who will want to hedge against uh possible drops in price for instance um there are there are borrowers who want to um, who are paying a floating rate and who want to hedge against rising interest rates. So, so like I, I guess a market is a combination of speculators and hedgers at, at its most um, at its most basic. So, I, I think I, I think in, in a way it's uh, like the the market, quote unquote, um, almost becomes this uh, this. Hypo well, it's not even hypothetical, but it, it becomes this almost necessary evil where where you allow these two groups of of um, people or institutions to to meet and and transact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's just so interesting to talk to a poet who comes from that background. And you mentioned you know wanting to go out and experience the world before getting back into poetry, and it definitely seems like you have in a in a world that you know, has a lot of opportunity for poetry um, that we haven't really 
<laughs> capitalized on, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> so it's great. It's just great. I mean, I just love the sounds of all these words and the way that you bring up and, and make me think of words in different ways, because in that context, they're different. Um, in this poem, the self-portrait is derivative trader. Um, I should say, before we have you read another poem, um, that if anybody has any questions for Jody, please do leave them in the chat windows, either on Facebook or YouTube. I'll pass any along. I saw a question earlier. Um, if you have any questions, though, uh, let me know, and I will pass along. It helps if you put like a Q or a question somewhere in all caps there. Um, and, and also, if you haven't clicked the like button yet, uh, please do. That really helps uh, help spread poetry around when you click on uh, like. It help, tells the algorithms <laughs> what to uh, what to pass on to other people, and that really helps. Um, but in the meantime, let's see another poem, Jody. Okay, let's see. We have um, alternate left and um, Jardin des Plantes, which I'm not sure if I'm saying right. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll read Jardin des Plantes. And again, it has an epigraph. I think that's one of my... <laughs> <laughs> I probably use epigraphs too much. Um, Jardin des Plantes has an epigraph from Rilke, Ein Tanz von Kraft und eine Mitte, uh, which in Edward Snow's translation is a dance of strength around the center. At the edge of a pond ringed by bars, herring gulls pace like students in a walled yard who keep a measured distance from each other, eye avoiding eye, sensing that the fight is about to break out after weeks of anticlimax. When a sparrow descends from a tree's topmost branch and lands on the shaded shallow end of the pond, it swigs the water, each gulp ruffling the feathers on its throat, and without warning, the nearest gull snatches it in its beak with the nonchalance of a pickpocket. As he turns toward some secret corner, another gull seizes the thrashing leg, and now they are two boys engaged in a tug of war, each gripping one end of the twine, refusing to give ground. Or rivals still locked in dance with the girl both desire, long after the attempt to cut in, eyes fixed on the others, not on the girl, and they dance and tug, tug and dance, until leg is torn from body. The loser drops it, stomps back into the flock, while the victor lays the sparrow on the ground and probes the belly, shadow looming over white breast. When he fishes out the intestine like a magician pulling from his pocket a braid of handkerchiefs, those who have been watching cannot help but cheer and applaud even the school children. Yeah, another great poem, great ending there too. That was um, Jardin des Plantes, I guess is how you say that last word. Um, and, and you do use epigrams a lot. There was one of the things I was going to ask you about. Um, why do you think that is? Does a lot of your poetry, do you feel, it, to me, poetry is sort of the grand dialogue of the human species, you know? And is um, is that one of the reasons that it's participating in this conversation with poets of the past? Um, yes, I, I, I think so. Uh, and um, in this particular case, um, I, I was responding to Rilke. Um, Rilke's one of my, uh, one of my heroes, um, especially as a you know, as a younger poet, and I know he has that letters to a young poet, um, his famous book, um, and so to the point where at a uh, at a um, like our family took a trip to Europe uh, in the nineties, and um, when when we went to Paris. One of the places I wanted wanted to visit was the Jardin de Plante because that's where he saw the famous panther of his of his poem. And um, I didn't see a panther, but you know, just while sitting there, I I saw I saw a scene which is essentially what I described here, and I like it. It was horrifying. <laughs> um, to uh, n I mean, I I guess like. The, what the what the herring gulls were doing to the smaller bird. I, I don't know if it was exactly um, a sparrow. <laughs> like I knew they were herring gulls because that was like that was their cage. That was what was um, in the that was what was labeled. But um, it, it like I, I guess there's this you know this is the quote quote unquote circle of life. But um, it 
I guess it was the reaction of the, the people who were watching this that, that horrified me. And, and so um, I thought, you know, in, in a way, the, like this, this um, experience uh, of watching, um, of watching the scene unfold kind of made me see that phrase by Rilke in a different light. Mm. Well, we kind of stole Brian O'Sullivan's question about, <laughs> he asked, he wanted to know what you like about using epigraphs, but a follow-up from Nate Jacobs is, um, which comes first, the epigraph or the poem or idea of the poem? Do you, uh, is it, is it always the, the epigraph first, like, like in that case? Um, in, in this, in this particular case, I think it was, it, it, it was the poem first and, uh, like I, I, I have horrible first drafts of this, <laughs> of this poem, which I'll never show anyone. Um, but you know, it, I, I guess the epigraph let, or the, the poem by Rilke led me to visit the place in Paris, which led me to experience the poem. So maybe in that sense, the epigraph came first, but like, uh, as far as, you know, trying to um, render my experience in language, I, I think the, the poem or the the experience came first and then all of a sudden oh this epigraph kind of um made me uh like i, I was able to refract the the um the the epigraph onto the poem mm -hmm. uh, but like in the case of the the self portrait as a derivative straighter like it, it was definitely the the epigraph that came first or the the letter to keats that i remembered and i and um and i i found it cool that he uses the word speculation which which that opened up th that opened up the poem for me mm -hmm. so it, I, I guess it's both it depends um um well um let's see and then uh what i want to ask was that um you know, you mentioned the 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 bad rough drafts. Um, what what makes them bad um, in a rough draft? Like, what do you you find? Um, what is the purpose and, and function of that, and what makes them not work as poems and that, that you chisel away until you have these gems that you end up with? Um, they're they're bad in the sense that you know they feel very stilted, um, awkward, um, trite, uh, like the. the uh, lacking energy, um, combination of all of the above. Um, I, I'm very self-critical and I, I have to be in that constant battle with my inner, inner critic to, to get writing done. Um, but I think, I think it's easier. It, it's very rare for me to, to draft something that, um, just needs minor polishing often often um it's it's really that i guess that blob of material that um that i i just need i just need something to push back on through the revision process rather than the blank page hmm. yeah well that, that's a great way to put it um one thing i wanted to follow up on too you mentioned you know working in education now um what is it that you do there and, and does poetry relate to that at all um indirectly <laughs> uh so i so after or after grad school i uh i so i work now in k-12 mm -hmm. um i taught high school english for about 11 years and now i'm a department head, so i'm not in the classroom anymore but i supervise english and history teachers Mm -hmm. Well, it, it sounds like a great job. Um, you know, it, English is definitely important and, you know, we need those new poets of the next generation. So I'm glad <laughs> you're participating in that. What, what do you find, um, how are the schools doing, do you think? Um, you know, that's something we've had a lot of teachers on who have talked about um, the difficulties in, in being a teacher these days. We had a you know, a poem to start out on Poets Respond about about libraries and book banning and, and yep. being fired for that. Um, there just seems like a lot of challenges. I know a whole bunch of people who've quit, you know, being, you know, K through 12 teachers because it's too difficult. Uh, I'd list them off, but um, they do want to bring them up again. But they do have, you know, a lot of people I know have, have gotten out of that just because it's so hard to deal with all of the both bureaucratic 
you know, impositions, also the parents and the students and behavioral issues and safety even. Um, so, so how, what is your sense of the education system? Is, are things getting, is, is that, is that, is there validity to that? Oh, uh, definitely. Um, I think, I, I think that, um, the, ever since, well, it's, it's not ever since, but I, I guess COVID mm -hmm. <laughs> exacerbated a lot of the challenges. Um, and there's been a lot of, I guess, um, uh, I'll use the umbrella term politics. Mm -hmm. uh, like there, there, there's been a lot of, uh, I guess, political um, involvement in what education should or should not be. Um, right now, I can tell you that what's what's in a lot of my teachers' minds is uh, the use of or students' use of Chat GPT, mm -hmm. um, which, which makes it which makes it quote unquote easier for students to you know just generate uh, a piece of a, a piece of writing or an essay and you know pass it off as their own so it's 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 very it 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 adds a new wrinkle in what's already a very um challenging environment but um you know we we persevere we try so and so part of my job is to support teachers or it's a big part of my job mm -hmm. And you know to to help support them, help them become better teachers in the midst of these challenges. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely, there's definitely a lot going on. Um, well, let's finish out with one last poem, and then we have illusion left. Illusion. Words are linked to other worlds of words. As when the poet writes, the bird Adarna, transforming adventurers to stone with its droppings. Or Padre Florentino, who hurls a chest full of jewels into the sea. For some, it is enough that the mind perceive the silhouette of the diamond tree in which the capricious bird perches and sings, perceive the priest's repudiation as the embracing of poverty. But when these readers depart, like a flock returning north for Ilium, Paradiso, Denmark, the Mississippi. Will such newfound glimpses fade forever, dead stars? But others, those for whom a star burns brighter when given a name, take the strange syllables in their hands. Each footnote becomes a thread leading into the labyrinth instead of out, and negotiating each dim passageway they may discover that the prince who cuts his hand seven times, squeezing a lime over each wound so the bird's seven songs won't charm him to sleep, and the filibuster, broken, who ingests poison before he leaves his jewels and his secret with the priest, are both really a country that yearns for its own borders, that waits for those who would echo its words, as when signals ignite along an island chain to announce a hero's return or a burial that hopes its songs will reach any destination before whether these are heard no longer matters. The streets occupation by legions of dust, the body having forsaken both its flesh and its name. Yeah, another great poem that was Illusion um, by Jose Edmundo Ocampo Reyes. Uh, thanks so much for being a guest. It was as fun as I thought, given, you know, how many things you have in your background to talk about. It's really interesting to have poets, um, that have a lot of different, uh, interests and, and things in their background. So thanks for being here and sharing your, your really rich layered poems with us and, and talking about all these topics. Thanks, Tim. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. And once again, that was uh, Jose Edmundo Ocampo Reyes. You can find his book, um, uh, Present Values, at backbonepress.org. So backbonepress, all one word, dot org, is where you'll find that book. And it's available as an ebook right now. So do pick it up. Now we're going to take a quick break and go to our prompt lines. And the uh, prompt for this week, if I can find out where to pull it up, there it is. The prompt for this week is to write a poem from the perspective of one of your childhood toys. So we're going to have some childhood toys coming up on this week's prompt, uh, inspired partially by Denise Duhamel's new Barbie poem uh, that we published last week in Poets Respond. 
Um, so if you have a poem like that, this is how you participate. I'm going to pull up the... Um, one second, I have to find it now. Here, there we go. I got the invitation link to the Zoom. So if you'd like to share a poem, join the Zoom link and email the poem first to prompt lines. That's prompt lines at rattle.com. Prompt lines, all one word at rattle.com. Email the poem there so I can show it on screen as you read it. Then join the Zoom link, which you'll find pinned in the chat windows on both Facebook and YouTube. Um, and uh, if you just want to sit back and enjoy poems, though, all you have to do is keep watching right where you're watching. So only come out of the Zoom if you have poems to share. And I'll be right back with more poetry. We're back. Thanks so much for your patience. Uh, we have our prompt poems editor with us here, Katie Dozier. Uh, hey, Katie, how are you doing? Yeah, it definitely is. There's uh, something really interesting about uh, about all that, about how it connects. You know, the the music of the scales and frequencies and repetition. Um, yeah, it was a really fun topic and, and fun too to talk about the financial sector, which we don't get to talk about very much <laughs> with poets. Um, and so, yeah, I enjoyed uh, just I, I always love getting to talk about different things on the Rattlecast. And that was a good one. I knew it was going to be good going in. Um, but the prompt this week was to uh, uh, write that about that childhood toy from that perspective. So what did you do for the prompt? How did you approach it? I approached it by thinking about the oldest childhood toy that I still own. So coming to you live is Mrs. Bear in her rather decrepit state. She didn't know she's going to be on camera, so you'll have to forgive her. Oh, Mrs. Bear, hi. <laughs> yeah, Mrs. Oh, Nate Jacobs looks like we have another teddy bear in the house. It's very exciting. Okay, it's going to be fun. Yeah, I, 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 uh, yeah, it'd be good if you have your childhood toy. I didn't even think of that. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. And then so, you also uh, did a, well, well, you can go, go ahead. ahead and read it. Yeah, no, go you ahead. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> okay. All right. So this, I was in part really, you know, inspired by Denise Duhamel's uh, poem last week because she was a huge influence on me. It's possible I wouldn't have gotten into poetry without the fact that Barbara Hamby assigned Kinky when I was, you know, at my first, you know, poetry major classes at FSU. And I was like, oh my gosh. You can put these things in poems. This is amazing. And so I'm grateful for that. And I had to work Barbie into this poem too, in homage. So. <laughs> well, great. Looking forward to hearing it. Go ahead. All right. Teddy bear arithmetic. Any old toy can tell you, but you must listen with care to hear, as if your ear directly cups a conch shell. Every memory is bundled in a forged shut trunk, but we must go and try to open what once had to be shut and locked. Oh, I'm sorry for my tattered, jam-stained skirt. It was once a kilt, bought in Scotland, the land of the bobbing Loch Ness Monster. But the girl picked me, not that Barbie, with a glittering organza tutu. Even Americans can spot plastic poise too perfectly. The girl quizzed my brown eyes, nuzzled me right away, took my paw, and then she whispered how we'd fly a kite tomorrow, how together we'd unwind the very wind. But viciously we blew away and wound up in the knockdown days, Xing out the answers from yesterday, resolving the math of a zero sum game by adding anyway. Yeah, excellent poem and an abecedarian in your own right. I, I was gonna say, 
Um, there was an adversarian too, but then I remembered you said that your dream was for no one to notice. And so I didn't want to spoil it to see if anybody yeah. <laughs> didn't notice. Um, I, I think the closest I got to that was Chelsea McClellan saying that she got to like W or something before she <laughs> noticed. And I'll take that as a win. That's there about as good as one could hope yeah. for. Yeah, I was going to um, say too uh, about the adversarian at the top of the hour. There's a trick to uh, being an editor with the adversarian. All you really have to read is the last like three sentences at first, like in the same way you do with a high bend to see if the haiku is good, because it all comes down to how you handle the X, Y, Z. Um, yeah. You know, if you can come up with some different words besides for X-ray and um, well, the Y is not so bad. There's some Y's, but then zoo. <laughs> so you're always getting an X-ray at the zoo at the yeah. end of a uh, abecedarian. I, but if you can smoothly yeah. work it in, then it works well. I predicted I would end up in a zoo because I wrote this in the middle seat of an airplane with a child that was not mine kicking me from behind. Ooh, that so, sounds like a zoo. <laughs> it, it felt like a zoo, um, but also a zero-sum game. So I guess it worked out. <laughs> yeah, well, great <laughs> job. Thanks for sharing that. And um, and here's mine for this week. I was thinking about, and I should have uh, pulled up like you did. I could maybe pull up this actual thing from but anyway. So uh, mine, I was thinking about like like the uh, toys that I had, and there were only really two toys I like played with a lot, which were Legos and GI Joe. And and I don't really can't think of a way that that was like poetic or something. So I was thinking like what else did I play with a lot? And then this came to me. Um, and here is um, is my toy, which was probably, you know, hour for hour, pound for pound, my favorite toy <laughs> when I was a kid. So here you go with this one. This is called Until the Streetlights Come On. It's still there, the old brick wall you'd all day throw a ball against. It stands adjacent to the chain link fence that's rusted now as if it's aging needed evidence. The swing set's gone, so too the chalk line strike zone that you drew and redrew every time it rained. The wall, though, still looks about the same. The stack of sandstone bricks at which you'd aim your two-seam fastball and your circle change always threw them back. The sound you made together was a song of all you'd never lack. Listen how you hum along even now. The whack, the whack, the whack. There's my poem uh really my favorite toy was a brick wall <laughs> and i really played that thing you'd think it would have fallen down by the time it was done <laughs> but it still stands yeah. well we'll have to find a brick wall again we, we, well there's one at the toys. elementary school and they repainted it they went from green to gray so i think mm -hmm. it's waiting for me maybe i have to go back and relive those days although i don't know if my um what well, my ligaments can hold up like they used to. <laughs> anyway. I'll help you if you fall down. But well, the sounds were so great in that poem. I really like it. Oh, well, thanks, Katie. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now let's see what everybody else has. Um, and uh, let's go first to Dick Westheimer. Hey, Tim. Hey, I Dick. agree with Katie and other folks uh, commenting on the sounds of your poem were just like, I, 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 I could hear you throwing that ball against the wall. Oh, thanks. Well, great you like it. It's, uh, it was one of those ones where the first line just dictates you have to, because the balls and walls were there, and they're like, oh, crap, I got to do a whole bunch of that <laughs> sound poem. But, uh, but it got there. Yeah. So so I went into the way back. Um, I called uh, m my oldest sister, and I said, what, did I, what, what do you remember I played with before I remember what I played with? Mm -hmm. And she sent me the picture that's on the poem that you're about to post. Oh, that's great. Okay, let's show it to everybody at home. Sorry if you're on the Zoom and can't see it yet. That is why it's good to keep watching on YouTube. But here is yeah. the photo um, that Dick had. Um, yeah, of, yeah. I'm not sure what kind of creature that is, Dick. You're going to have to help us. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was called Tommy. It was my Tommy doll. Mm -hmm. uh, and I must have dressed it up. I just showed this picture to my uh, grandkids who are in town, and they were freaked out <laughs> it is a little bit um a little bit freaky you gotta say like one little, of those Dell factory type things in the in the ears in the ufo that's spinning there which i guess is a top but it looks like yeah it's that's an alien like one visitor. of those old tin, tin, uh, tin tops that mm -hmm. uh finds its way in, in into the poem yeah but what a as, cute little kid you were too i have to say dick yeah you know things <laughs> change don't they that was uh <laughs> Um, I was I was going to write something about how both we were mistaken for each other because of our size of our eyes that never <laughs> shut, but I didn't make it in. Well, let's hear it. Uh, so in conversation with an old friend about the nature of a strong force, Tommy Dahl called. He and I used to talk nonstop, he said. 
When I was three or maybe four, Tommy loved to watch me spin my tin top, pull the strings on my whirly gig, twirl my sister's jacks. You'd talk with them too, he said. You asked them about gravity, about the centrifugal forces that throw everything into disarray, including you. You'd lie awake at night, discerning patterns on the wallpaper. Every room was written in a code that only you knew. I recall you asking me to explain how sleep works, and I responded, you must stop attending to the spinning. You whispered back, that's all there is, the spin and pull, the patterns inside patterns, the gravity of it all. I still spin, I told him. I pull at strings all night and wonder the rules of sleep. He sighed and replied, I felt sorry for you. You were one who never let go for fear you'd fly off like a swung ball cut from its line. That, I mused, would be sublime. Uh, great sounds and internal rhyme in that too, Dick. Uh, really wonderful sound poem there and great use of the voice too, that Tommy Dow. <laughs> yeah, great poem. <laughs> Uh, it sounded just like them to me. <laughs> um, anyway, I appreciate. It. Can't can't wait to hear the others. Yeah, me too. And I can't wait to. I, somebody, some people held up their their things too. Or if you have photos too, it's great. I can't wait to see them too. Thanks, Dick. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, that was Dick Westheimer with in conversation with an old friend about the nature of a strong force. Very interesting. Let's go to a first time participant here in the prompt lines, and Molly Howes is here. Hi, everybody. There you go. Hello. Great to see you. I'm really psyched to be here. I've been listening um, to the Rattlecast later and uh -huh. just, uh, you know, loving it so much. So oh, glad so, to be so wonderful. So where are you calling from? That's always nice to hear. Right now, I'm at St. Pete Beach. Ah, very nice. <laughs> That's not where I live, though. <laughs> no, okay. Where, where do you live? Where are you from? Outside Boston. Ah, gotcha. So, so what do you have uh, to share tonight? Um, this is called Why Do You Doubt Me? Just because I always wear the widest, never-changing smile doesn't mean that I don't see the harder, sadder things, the things you try to hide. I could tell on that first night from the way your arms cradled me and didn't let go, the way you put your face up close to mine and kissed my canvas cheek, that you were a lonely girl. I could tell you needed me to be steady, and so I was. I never minded that your tears spotted and stained my face. I like to have a purpose, to give you someone to love who didn't break or leave. My love for you would never end. I'll never understand why you checked again and again to see if the letters in red that said I love you were still written on my chest. Oh, what a sweet poem. So touching. Thanks so much for sharing that. And what was your, what was the name of that toy? Why do you doubt me? Uh, of the of the um, of the doubt. Oh, it was Raggedy Ann. Ah, oh, Raggedy Ann. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for sharing that. Um, and really touching poem. Thanks so much. I, I really never had a Raggedy Ann doubt. Did they have a um, "I love you" on the chest? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, thanks for sharing that, Molly. Thanks. Yeah, that was Molly House with a "Why do you doubt me?" Um, yeah, really nice. Um, and always great to have new people on the lines. Uh, Nate Jacob is next. Hey there. Hey, Nate. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, I did not write about my teddy bear, but this is Radar's teddy bear. Uh -huh. <laughs> great show, Matt. Excellent. I didn't get that out in my teens, though, so that's a little embarrassing. <laughs> no, it's not. It never is, Nate. Never is. <laughs> uh, but like you, I wrote about baseball. Oh, nice. More baseball poems. It is that time of year. I think the opening day is like like five days away or something like that. So I oh, can't wait. Yeah. It's the best time of year. So uh, all I did when I was growing up was play baseball 24-7. Mm -hmm. Yep. Been That's there. Life. So uh, it did so much good, too. You know, it really, <laughs> yeah. it really made the most of <laughs> the skills nowadays. Yeah, I, I went far with it for sure. <laughs> Uh, but I wrote from the uh, perspective of my glove and all the gloves in my family, actually. Yeah. Titled, For Glove of the Game. We would wait the long, dark winters out under mattresses in the unfinished basement, rarely dug out into the light 
except to tend goal when beds moved aside for roller hockey nights. Then once pitchers and catchers reported and the backyard thawed from the center out, we had our own opening days as the old man warmed us on his calloused hands, massaged life back into us with mink or sweet baby oil, retied laces, wrapped us hard with cracking rubber bands around mud rubbed balls inside oily garage rags until the first dry weekend warmed our hides and smaller hands held us too high and too loose. And the old man tried until he cussed out loud to land underhanded lob after underhanded lob in the deep worn wells he'd worked into us. While the young feigned 10 minutes interest under mother's threat, catching and tossing almost while talking of lucky friends in better places. Then summer days lengthened and the old man shortened his patience for these rookies until we found ourselves sunning, drying and bleaching out in the middle of the backyard ball diamond, the distance between home and first base longer each spring grown over by summer, blanketed by leaves each fall until raked at last onto the deck, then the basement again. Baseball is life, but it's an old man's game here. Uh, I love that, Nate, and I love a baseball poem always, and that the distance between home and first base longer each spring. <laughs> yeah, that's really Thanks. wonderful. The glove <laughs> of the game. Thanks for sharing that, Nate. Thanks a bunch. Yeah. Uh, Nate Jacob with For the Glove of the Game. Uh, Colin Sandberg is up next. Hello there, Tim. How are you? I'm great. Good to see you, Colin. Hey, it's good to be here. Um, per usual in my life, I am I am late, and uh, I have a, a couple of awe poems. There's the from last week, weeks um, from a last week's prompt, uh -huh. and so, um, I have two of them. Um, I, I is it okay if I share share both? Yeah, they're, they're short. Both? The part of the prompt yeah. is to be short, and that's a good reminder because I always should say yeah. and I always forget that if you have older prompt poems, you know that weren't for this week but want to share them anyway, you are always welcome, no matter how far back they go if they were written for the prompt. So, yeah, it's good to look yeah. back at that. Um, and, and yeah, they're both short sonnet like size. Uh, feel free to yeah. share them. Um, yeah, and so and just a little back background, um, it, just perfect timing with the with the prompt. Um, I was a groomsman in my best friend's YA wedding, mm -hmm. um, marrying one of my other for A friends, and so I had plenty of opportunities, plenty, um, yeah, just plenty of opportunities to catch other people's awe and and try to then like a couple days later try to really process and um, yeah, just had a, had a bunch of fun. Um, with this. And so um, can we start with the second one? Yeah, sure. Go um, ahead. Master's Party at Northwest mm -hmm. Arsenal in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, so that's what it's called. By the way, shout out to North Northwest Arsenal in Eugene, Oregon. Um, we uh, we had so much fun and uh, it, was a, it was a blast, um, kind of pun intended. <laughs> um, so uh, here, here it is, Bachelor Party at Northwest Arsenal in Eugene, Oregon. A G-18 almost flamed our brows, our wrists all twists. Our instructor while instructing coolly called the rate of fire switch, the giggle switch. Our terrified thoughts cleared. The grip calmed us through our hands while adjusting how to hold. Damp armpits, spot for headstock, pop, pop, then burst shot, bruh, bruh. Then each drained with one pull, 30 bullets, making Swiss the cardboard. But our smallest groomsmen, least experienced in guns, tucked his nerves and put the black and automatic M14 to his chest. The sounds of massive rounds goosebumped our backs. At the reception dinner, that video was shown and all were open mouthed around the iPhone. Oh, very cool, a yeah, great last couplet. And another, you know, given today's uh, guest uh, with different topics that poets don't usually touch, the gun range is not a topic that shows up very often. So thanks for sharing that interesting poem. And uh, let's hear the other one too. Sweet. And uh, th this one is, uh, yeah, it's called Just Keep Your Eyes on the Bride, Groomsman. And uh, by the way, before I start, um, just shout out to the Gads, Tyler, Brittany, Brittany Gad. Um, I love you guys, and this is dedicated to you guys. Um, so just keep your eyes on the bride, Groomsman. Framed by his shoulders, arrayed in blue wool, and a lay of melee laced with white pekake. Her eyes played Mozart, raw towards the groom. His eyes wetly bloomed with rose as sighs ballooned throughout the chapel pews. 
their synergy of fingers newly banded, bonded and bound through laughing vows, arms swung, bouncing like chain link park swings pushed by children. The dusk was dappled by chapel shades. The room attended her eyes, crescendoing his cheeks. His vows to never quit slid opened her mouth, as if she was drinking wonder through that wound, her jaw so slackened. A quiet concerto breathed with cellos as she unfolded her violin vows. Oh, that's beautiful. Another, it's just wonderful having, a, you know, relevant to life poems, too, that you can share, um, you know, for people like that at a wedding. Thanks for sharing both of those. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks so much. That was Colin Sandberg with the two poems, Just Keep Your Eyes on the Bride, Groomsman, and a Bachelor Party at Northwest Arsenal in Eugene, Oregon. Really interesting poems there. Um, and I always love the form, too. Um, let's go next to uh, Chelsea McClellan. Hello. Hi, Chelsea. Yeah, great. Great to see you. Great to be here. <laughs> As always. So what have you got for us? Um, so I'm just going to let the poem reveal what the toy was. Uh, the poem is called Overly Sensitive. Ah, okay. Overly Sensitive. <clears throat> Easy. The girls snicker. I shrink. Wrap myself tight. Butterface, boys whisper. Eager hands await their bite, and I, taught to turn my cheek, shine 100 incandescent watts to bake their bitter cocoa treat. I do not tell them they forgot the sugar. One bite, and he knows that something's missing. Again, with sugar, he butters me up, shows me off, to batter me with laughs. And then, after putting me back in my place, they take turns turning up the heat. I come out burned, disgraced, overly sensitive, they call me, and pull the plug. I dream of being big enough to hold a wedding cake. Perhaps when I grow up, I will be, and no one will call me the easy bake. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I saw that come about halfway through. <laughs> that's probably the perfect amount of timing, too, for that. And great ending on it, too, the reveal. Thanks so much for sharing that, Chelsea. Thank you. Yeah, very it's funny. a great part. Yeah, yeah, great. It was Overly Sensitive um, by Chelsea McClellan. Um, next up is uh, Mary Keating. Hi. Hi welcome Mary. back. Yeah, Mary welcome Keating. back. Good to see you. We missed you on Critique of the Week, but I know you guys needed a break. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We'll be back this week, though, so don't worry. And it's a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. But, so but it this, was. We had this, a good fun hiking around uh, Utah. So this was a fun prompt, and it's so much fun to hear about people's toys growing up. And I, you made me remember this doll I got, and it was this foreign doll, and it was encased in a box with a clear face to it. So she looked at like a on an armature. Mm -hmm. So I read it from her perspective. Oh, okay, cool. A doll's life. Well, I say this is a particular kind of torture. Dressed in traditional stiff attire of a country I'm not even from. Talk about getting the obsolete, absolute worst assignment from the toy maker gods. Seriously? I'm sealed behind a clear window posted to an armature with ties sharp enough to cut into my flesh if real. Don't mean to sound like a harpy, but standing countless days with no reprieve. All designed around a make-believe girl who will throw her arms around me for keeps. Now I'm wrapped inside darkness. No air holes. Fortunately, I don't need to breathe. Whoa, I'm on some kind of roller coaster ride. Hey, anybody out there? Where am I? Eternity passes like a starless mantle until pine and carols fill the air. I'm carried in my shrouded coffin one last time before I'm laid to rest. Ripping sounds, giggles, a wide-eyed wonder lets light pour back into my world, frees me from bondage, pulls me so close 
Her heartbeats tap dance music into my soulless body. So this is love. Wow, I'm smiling. For real. Oh, another sweet poem. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mary. That was A Doll's Life by Mary Keating. And, and it's just, it's great to get back into that childlike mindset. So thanks for the journey. Thank you. Yep, take care. I'm Mary Keating with A Doll's Life. Next up is Evan Gore. I think a first time um, participant. Hey, Evan. Yes, indeed. Hello, I am a first time participant. Yeah, well, glad I'm to having... have you here. And, and as always, where, where are you calling from? I'm calling from uh, Los Angeles, California. Ah, right down the hill from me right now. <laughs> oh, right yes. Away. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the question is, where's my poem? There it is. Um, I, I have to uh, quickly say, my uh, this year I'm having my very first poem ever selected for publication, and it's oh. a baseball poem. Ah, congratulations, and definitely love the baseball poems. Been a perfect time here for that, like we were saying. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Yes, that. Thank you very much. Um, and... Uh, the point of view prompt on this one really pushed my writing. So today I bring you a note from the underground. Interesting. Okay. I haven't changed much in the years since my final toss in a trash can, since moving to my cozy home into the solid waste landfill for the next 900 years. Lots of time to think back and relive the overhand throws, the underhand, the boomerangs. It really was a free time for all of us. But those boys, time is a quick spin, then whammo. Those boys must remember me as I do them. Our afternoons after school in the spring sun, earth, wind, and fire in the air, spinning out of the speaker in the window, spinning me like a record, those boys, their catches. I remember their throws, fast and flat, sometimes into a tree or a rooftop, those boys, that fast time, critiquing teachers, grading girls, sometimes disagreeing, becoming different, becoming older with every toss, every after school. Did they all leave Milwaukee? I'll never know. Those boys are probably men now with their own backyards, divorces and promotions, catching whatever Frisbee's life tosses at them. Maybe one died from a hole in his heart Maybe one has frisbee spinning boys of their own, or girls, or friends, cousins, parents, just having a catch after school, so at ease. They don't know that they are free as they will ever be, and time is short, and none of it is solid waste. Oh yeah, I love that ending, and I love that line, uh, they will never know uh, they are free as they will ever be. Yeah, I had my own frisbee fra phase too, uh, really great toy there thanks for sharing that evan thank you for having me yeah thank you that was evan gore with a note from the underground um next up let's go to bizwajit mishra hey tim hey really great to see you yeah good to see you too i guess you guys had a good time <laughs> <laughs> yeah we definitely did it was a lot of fun a beautiful place that that you, you know, saint george and zion national park yeah Good. That's, I mean, that's one of my two new places I have to go. Yeah, well, it's definitely worth it. Like anywhere <laughs> you turn is just this majestic landscape. It's amazing, for, especially for your uh, your haiku and photography passion. Uh, that'd be a great combination for you. I think you should get a, maybe the Canadian Endowment for the Arts or something can pay you to go <laughs> to or take pictures of the haiku. That'd be a good idea. <laughs> no, no, I wanted to go. I almost did uh, uh, meant, uh, that uh, Grand Canyon that, but I chose to go drive with my cousin uh, to Vegas instead uh -huh. because he was in um, uh, what's that Phoenix. So he said, we, "Where are we? There are three places: Los Angeles, here, or you want to go to Grand Canyon." I said, "Let's go to the Sin City first. <laughs> well, I think uh, it's a good contrast to the yeah. Zion area. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so what do you have to share with us today, Biz? Oh, uh, I got. I couldn't remember of toys. I don't remember what we were so much playing outside in my time. Mm -hmm. Everything we could create toys, but this one I remember certainly there was a gun. Oh, okay, <laughs> that is the only one I could remember. I can't remember any other toys I played with. Interesting. <laughs> it's, it's called Bond. Okay. Your dad got me for you. You were little. Can't remember how old you might have been. 
I was ordered out of Kolkata. Good grief, you must be pretty old now, because it's now called Kolkata. You were so happy when I was delivered and you turned into a bandit or a hero, uh, because you only knew heroes. I can't even call you a fake cowboy, because you didn't know about them. But you feigned an action like what you call now of an action hero. Yes, I recall now, James Bond. I don't think you had watched his movies, nor read books. I think you hadn't even watched any English movie in your little town with a ramshackle, bug-infested theater until later. But you and your buddies knew Bond, down to his employee ID. Not just Bond, not even James Bond, but James Bond 007. The whole enchilada, like one of your Texas investor bankers would say in 2017, helping with a deal that never came home. You brandished me with a tight, light tan wooden butt in your hands like a pistol. I'm rethinking about your knowledge about cowboys. You were pretending a hold up or stopping one when you fired a cork bullet at your visiting aunt and hit her straight in the eye. A real screw up and that too on the first day right off the box. But he had good history. So everything worked out fine in the end. Though you were scared, what had happened when your dad came home from work? Uh, great memory and great weaving of different <laughs> stories in there, which was yet interesting, uh, interesting story. And I hope the aunt was okay. <laughs> yeah, she was, because I was scared. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> the first day, I was real scared. Yeah. Well, uh, uh -huh. well <laughs> thank thanks so much you. for sharing that. Yeah, really fun oh, poem. Thank Bond. You. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Good night, Tim. Good night. <laughs> It was Bond by Bishwajit Mishra. And next up, let's go to um, David H.T., who is David, um, I'm going to find it over here. Hutchinson Tipton. Hutchinson Tipton. <laughs> Thank you. And um, hopefully, hopefully my internet connection stays stable. Three minutes ago, people were fuzzing out, so... Okay, well, let me, uh, okay, here, the, oh, I see the, uh, the poem you got for us. Okay, That's so, uh, and, and the internet connection looks fine right now, too, so glad you could make it onto uh, the stream, and uh, so, Little Red Fire Engine, that brings back memories, too, it's a little trips down memories lanes today. Yeah, it's a, it's a combination of, you know, my dad helped his dad build, actually build a fire hall, so mm -hmm. that was a big part of their life, uh, and then my mother love the story of the little engine that could so oh. i found these uh, melding as i as i wrote okay, well, yeah go ahead the little red fire engine talented though it was knew that no amount of i think i can i think i can would get it anywhere so it flirted with despair until the boy said the lincoln log cabin was on fire and the engine had to be mobilized by fingers still greasy from a grilled cheese sandwich to save the day. Oh, I love that turn and ending. Yeah, the very cool poem, Little Red Fire Engine. Thanks for sharing that, David. Thank you. Great to be here again. Yeah, thanks. That was David Hutchison Tipton with uh, the Little Red Fire Engine. Um, next is another, I believe, a first-time caller. Maybe maybe she was on a little while ago. Ruth Kennedy? First time, definitely, calling yeah. from um, Ottawa, Ontario. Excellent. Well, thank, so glad you could join us. So thanks for being here. Have you been watching a long time? Yes, I've been watching for quite a while, so it's been great. great. Yeah, well, it's great, nice to have, to be here. great to have you on board. So what would you like to share? Um, a poem called Flatsy, which was um, a kind of a two-dimensional doll. It was about five inches high. A few people might remember those. Oh, interesting. I've never heard of that, but that sounds fascinating. <laughs> hey, have you forgotten me? I've been buried here for decades in the landfill. A few inches below me is your Easy Bake Oven that never worked. A couple of feet above me is your Etch-a-Sketch, which did. Ever since your mom tossed me out, I've wondered how you were doing. Remember when we met? It was Christmas. You were five. I was copyright 1969, direct from Hong Kong, with long orange hair, pink scarf, blue vest, fuzzy lime green chaps, and best of all, a black belt for the holsters carrying my very flat pistols. You had a set of your own, so you totally got me. I can't thank you enough for ripping me out of the frame I came in and ignoring the suggestions on the box. Posable doll, 
comb her hair, wear her on your clothes. Stunningly unimaginative. We did everything together. You snuck me into school, church, and your great-grandparents' 60th wedding anniversary. What a party that was. You were so sweet, you wrote a verse for me. Flatsy, my Flatsy, my favorite doll. You fit in my pocket because you're so small. I bet you're old and wrinkly now, still writing poetry, still a bit of a cowgirl edge about you, still carrying talismans in your pockets. I bet if you try, you could recall the day my wires poked through my vinyl skin. You pretended it hadn't happened, pained that I was no longer suitable as plaything. It's okay to touch back in now and again. I'll be here decomposing hundreds of years after you're gone, after your body turns to dust, my memories of you will linger on. We both, we both played our parts in the Anthropocene. That will be our shared legacy. Oh, what an interesting toy to remember. And you got maybe your first ever poem in there too. Is that your first poem, you think? The Flatsy, my Flatsy? <laughs> No, I just made that up. <laughs> okay. Well, way to be honest, too. I believed it. It sounded authentic to me, but I love that. What a what a fun uh, what a fun poem there. Thanks for sharing that. Sure. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Yeah, that was uh, Flatsy by Ruth Kennedy, and uh, let's go to another first time poet. We have a bunch this week, which is cool. So Joby is here, and there's uh, Joby Townshend hey. Zellner. Hey, Zoby. Hey, good to see you, Timothy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for calling. And where are you calling from? I'm from San Diego. Ah, not too far away. Not a great city we like to go to on little road trips. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Glad you come here. So uh, what is it that you'd like to share? Okay, my poem is titled Monkeying Around. Ah, okay. Well, let's hear it. Now, monkey dear, you said... You get to dance with castanets. Then my grayish stuffed sock head, arms and legs became a blur of motion all around the kitchen cock a doodle doodle do all around the kitchen cock a doodle doodle do and we all fall down cock a doodle doodle do. Then you laughed as you rolled on the floor. You almost squashed me flat. I never understood what you found so funny. Thank God you had a serious side, invited all us dolls to a proper tea now and again. But for now, please don't leave me on the floor. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for sharing that. That was uh, really sweet. And I love the, the perspective there, the use of that and getting a song in great reading and performance of it too. Thanks for sharing that. Bet a little time travel. Thanks for traveling back with me. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks for going there. Appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, and that was um, Jody Avonley, I should have said, with a monkeying around. Thanks for sharing that. Jody, and I should say, too, I'm glad you included the poem in the body of the document because I can't open the pages files. It's the one kind of file that Google doesn't recognize. Okay. Um, so thanks for sharing it that way too, in the you future. Um, let's see. Laura Berg is up next. <clears throat> Hello. Hello, Laura. Great to see you today. This is a lot of fun, sort of tapping into people's childhood memories. Yeah, it definitely is. It definitely is. Uh, so what do you have for us? I have the French dolls tete-a-tete. -tete. Interesting. You're an old biddy, said the can-can dancer doll, kicking up her leg, decked in black fishnet stockings. The left one falling off from being raised and dropped too many times. She was saying this to a lace maker doll with silver hair and granny glasses. All you do is sit and tat, and though your costume is velvet, it's dusty and your head is plastic. Plus you have nothing under that skirt and the lace you make is frou-frou. I wouldn't want to turn into you. Granny didn't mind. Kick all you want, she said, but keep your ruffles clean. I can tell you're a soft doll. Then she sighed. You know, that child is American, a new generation, and won't grow up to be like either of us, even if she loves you to pieces. Oh, thanks for sharing that. Another sweet poem, Childhood Memories. Uh, that was uh, French Dolls Tete-a-Tete by Laura Berg. Thanks, Laura. 
Yeah, I, I, I do love the, you know, when the memories, I like the memory poems are my favorite, and especially sweet memories. Um, let's go next to uh, Susan Talley. Oh, and I see Nibidita. We'll jump to Nibidita next after that. Hey, Susan. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Great to see you. Thank you. I went back to the prompt before. Uh-huh. <clears throat> <clears throat> the ocean. Tether your story to one five foot wave in succession, iambic pentameter, laps to the shore, a Homeric story once formed foam, a generation of myths in the mist may reach parchment sand to leave mystical impressions, footprints have copyrights. For others, automatic writing rolls in the seas. Language, what rises at the crest, has the sunlight for mentor. And after midnight, the moon edits the wavy silver to return a dishes to the shore. Today, anyone's story goes to the beach. I say tag your wave, modern, past modern, flashed prose to widen the margins an entire beat to run the riddles any which way. Traces in the sand, parchment if we call it so. Oh, very interesting. I love the sort of freedom and leaping around that poem makes. Oz, Ocean Wave. Thanks for sharing that so Thank much, you. Sally. Yeah, that was, uh, um, yeah, Sally, Susan Talley, I should say, sorry, um, with uh, Ocean Wave. Thanks for sharing that, Susan. Um, yeah, very cool. And uh, next... Let's go to Nivedita, who is here on her break. Hey, Nivy, how are you doing today? Um, hi, Tim. I'm doing great, thank you. How about you? I'm doing great. It's always great to see you. Um, so who? what was your childhood toy? Um, okay, so I basically started writing about three of them, but then I kept coming back to my first one, which was about one of the very first teddy bears that my parents ever got for me. It was a dog, and I called it Toto. Aw, um, the poem is not fully completed, but then I know I just sort of felt like this is the one that I have to read and I have to work on in the future. So despite it not being complete, that's the one I'm deciding to share today. Great too, and a sonnet I see as well. Yeah, looking forward to hearing it. Toto, in the pride of place beside the bed, I recite a quiet sentinel with my button eyes open wide, bound together with love, my fur bears the marks of time. Yet within these scenes, countless memories intertwine. Every day unfolds in a world of imagination, as my best friend's laughter fills the air with a palpable sensation. In her embrace, I find solace. She's a treasured confidant. And through these whispered secrets, our bonds remain undaunted. From tea parties to adventures many, I journey with her happily, pleased as a perfectly polished penny. Though I'm silent and unable to bark or wag my tail with delight, in her arms I thrive as our fantasies take flight. In her heart I found my sanctuary, a safe space to roam. As Toto the companion, I have finally found my true home. Oh, another sweet one. I love Toto. As perfect as a as a perfectly polished penny <laughs> to green line there. Thanks for sharing that, Nivy. Thank you, Tim. Yep, take care. There's a Nivy DeCarthic okay. with a Toto. So very interesting. I love looking at all these toys from childhood. Jared Campbell is next up. Hello. Hey, Jared. Great to see you. Good to see you. Let's um, see. I've got your poem. Um, yep. Oh, my. Another one after my heart. I thought about it, but I wasn't sure how to make, like I said, Legos poetic, but it seems like yeah, you it's... have. It's hard to write from the perspective of a of a, of a Lego brick. <laughs> exactly, that was so, that was the tricky part. <laughs> so. Yeah, so it's called fit. Oh, I can see that's a good good direction, good angle to go there. Snap so, that together. Okay, it's like another life remembering back before we met, when only a ghostly ache augured your resistance. Your opaque. We've learned that what I have fits what you lack, and vice versa. We click into a stack. I need your take and give and give and take, exploring what the two of us can make, circling each other like the Zodiac. 
I'm under no illusion our interaction is unique or built to last forever, but curiosity and satisfaction can't let each other be. I wonder whether, underneath the surface, it's attraction or if it's friction that keeps us together. Oh, very cool. Great, great idea to go there. And there's a picture of the Legos too, the two uh, classic two by four bricks <laughs> clicked together. Yeah, really fun poem. Thanks for sharing that. That's fit. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, fit um, by uh, Jared Campbell. And uh, let's see. Next, we have uh, Lucy Chow. Hello. Hi, Lucy. Great to see you. How you doing? I'm doing great, and I'm having great weather here up in Berkeley. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I, it, it seems like all of California is doing pretty good right now for as far as weather. We had a nice day after some snow yesterday. Yeah, that's great, and great conversation Yeah, with you. Uh, so so what was your childhood toy? Um, I don't actually have a childhood toy. I wasn't really a toy person, uh -huh. but I had really a um, great jolly amount of fun with a botanical guide growing up as a child in China. Oh, that's really interesting. So th that was the voice speaking from the poem. And I used a really like bizarre form because and I found found it really difficult to write into this mm -hmm. this botanical guide. So I really need something very restrictive to distract my mind. And let's see how it comes out. Okay, yeah, let's hear it. And then tell us about the form after. I'm curious. Go ahead. Um, this is called All Bad by my botanical body Mecham. And body Mecham is a Latin word for a handbook or a guide that is kept constantly for a consultation. And it literally means go with me. So that's what the poem starts with. All right. You walk with the plants, walking with me, bidding farewell to pre-dawn's half-light. You peruse my protein and erudite face. You walk with the plants, walking with me, greeting garden folks gleeful with daylight, each busy with work of family and tribe. You walk with the plants, walking with me, bidding farewell to pre-dawn's half-light. Greeting garden folks, gleeful with daylight, morning glories, dandelions, oxalis, Veronica and Nemophila's winsome eyes. Greeting the garden girl, gleeful with light, that walks each day with unfailing faith. As I faithfully read you their magical names, greeting garden folks, gleeful with daylight, morning glories, dandelions, oxalis. I walk you each day with unfailing faith through gardens, wasteland, meadows, glades. When you wake, farewell to botanical dreams. I walk you each day with unfailing faith to worlds of equal recognition and amaze, multiplying mysteries with myriad names. I walk you through with unfailing faith in gardens, wastelands, meadows, glades. Your worlds of equal recognition and amaze are renewed whenever a name whenever a name dawns on you, and you wake as on the first bright lit morning the world is born of recognition and amaze. You walk with the plants walking with me out of ineffable names on my grimoire pages to you daydreaming recognition and amaze all plants I name walking to dawn with you yeah really interesting poem thanks for sharing that uh lucy and what what is the form i see the refrains there um what is, what is that form i don't really i don't recognize it. it it's kind of i i found this form in another poet's book mm -hmm. and it's kind of i think it's a like a, a blend of like um, a villanelle and a pentum and that, that sort of a, mm -hmm. a looping, repetitive kind of form with a lot of... Yeah, I was thinking a, a triolet in a, <clears throat> in a pantoum Intricate, maybe or something like but that. But yeah. I, I feel 
like it's it mimics this like um step by step walking mm -hmm. and it's like sort of like walking back and forth and or when you are um looking to and fro from a plant and the botanical guide so i mm -hmm. i think that's interesting to like, experiment with that yeah well very cool and, and really cool to use that as your childhood toy the botanical guide really interesting on both fronts thanks for sharing that lucy yeah thank you yeah it was lucy chow with um obeyed uh, by my botanical vare mecum very interesting poem there thanks for sharing that and that is going to wrap up the uh zoom we have a few poets uh who are hanging around and uh wanted to share a poem though ted guevara um is here and has his favorite toy and he has a picture i assume that's what it is let's take a look at uh this by ted bernal guevara it's um the the what do you call these things maybe it'll be in the poem it's the the farmer says see and say it's right there the uh you know the cow says moo the dog says you know you pull the string and the little thing spins all right for those just watching at home if you know what i'm talking about and here is ted's poem called see and say which i never knew what those were called so that's interesting right off the bat see and say we're always curious what's in there so i'm inside and the first thing i encountered was the coyote and how and he was contemplating suicide for the fact he is labeled a farm animal. Yeah, I said. I was four, but I already sounded like Jack Nicholson. It turned out that Coyote wedged himself in the spools and springs in protest so that nobody can push down on a lever anymore. I became mad. Get out of there, I demanded. But the Coyote wouldn't move. He wouldn't even make an effort. So I grabbed his matted tail and pulled. He still wouldn't budge. So if my baby sisters inherited this toy and they dialed around to the coyote, they'd hear Jack Nicholson cussing the hell out of the wild thing. <laughs> it's a very fun, fun direction to take that poem. That was See and Say by Ted Bernal Guevara. Thanks for sharing that. And is there a, there is a coyote if you look back at this picture. <laughs> there really is a coyote on uh, his See and Say from uh, Mattel. How is that? Uh, well, <laughs> I guess they're, they're causing trouble on the farm anyway. Well, thanks for sharing that, Ted. And um, one second, I gotta. Where is that? Had a little tickle in my throat, but I couldn't find the mute button because my thing is still all messed up. Anyway, um, let me see. We have. Um, um, is this. Okay, so we have another poem by a Susie Leifer. And I think I'll read this one too, since we have time. She sent this in for the Taze prompt. Um, not here on the Zoom, but that's all right. <clears throat> and here we go. This is uh, The Learning Curve. Okay. The Learning Curve. Kids laughed and bullied you because you couldn't ride a bike. Relied on training wheels for years. Called you a baby. Stay with a trike. I kept waiting for you. I knew you were out there. My friend, I imagined the fun we would have for hours on end. You asked for me, begged for me, a gift not small, and on Christmas Day I leaned against the wall, beside a lighted tree. All the other gifts were present, presented in wrap and bows. I stood naked, no pretty paper, waiting for you to find and clap as you discovered my presence that day. We were both excited when you entered the room and saw me on display. Your eyes were wide with delight. You and your joy were quite the sight. You inspected your gift and your euphoria complete. And me with a paint job, shiny and red, with silver spokes and a white leather seat. It's what I've always wanted, you said. They noted it would take time to learn to ride, but once you do, you'll be beaming with pride. You stood by me first, admired me, you sat on me, but also you peed your pants a time or two. It should have been easy to visit the loo. <laughs> you relieved yourself on me when you had to wee. You're going too fast, you're going to wreck, crash, boom, quala blenum. Uh, I cursed in Latin, screaming. I knew this would happen. Your landings were never as soft as satin. Okay, sorry, I'll keep my ego in check. You wrecked me, dented me, nearly destroyed me. And with you, I almost lost some of my sanity. Over time, you were a test that I have the patience. I, in learning to ride, you were steadfast and tenacious. 
It was not a wobbly path. There was no path. Every time you sat on the seat, you fell on the side in a crash. I thought the bumps and bruises and bloody knees would prevent you from learning to ride with ease. Children laughed, poked fun. What's wrong with you? Did you lose a wheel? And yet you never abandoned your zeal. You had your learning curve, and I thought you would lose your nerve. Persistence through the crash and the pain praise you deserve. When finally you learned to ride, you dressed like a clown and took an excursion in a celebratory Christmas parade. You dressed me up, too, to ride on paved streets in town. I grinned wide in silent cheer. You were not afraid. When you were grown, you left me alone in the barn. I believed you would never return. Oh, darn. I, to keep me out of the way, I was hung from the ceiling on hooks. Over the years, I faded while you, with your study and books... But you came back to rescue me from rust and ruin. You wanted me, not a new one. You took me to a shop to have me sandblasted. Wow, that was rough. Rougher than you back in the day. Me, my before and after, though, highly contrasted. I'm shiny, red again after the paint. It was, sigh, spray. And looking back, you relied on four wheels and graduated to two wheels. But with me, you were a star with all the feels. Training wheels did not accompany me. I had only one wheel. Your mastery of the unicycle was for real. You were not slack. <laughs> a very interesting poem. The unicycle. Um, and the poem was The Learning Curve by, um, um, by um, who was that? The Learning Curve by Susie Leifer. So uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, and, uh, oh, Carla Schwartz is here. And so let's see if Carla Schwartz can pop on the video too. Yeah, hey, Carla, I was wondering where you were today. Uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> let me just let me just shut the video. Okay, um, <laughs> I'm here. Well, good now. to see you. Glad you made it. I'm glad I made it too. And I have a poem for tonight's prompt uh -huh. at the very last minute, <laughs> and um, and I sent it in earlier. Yep, I have it right here. Finger paint. Yes, finger paint. It is. <laughs> it's a hyphen. In my youth, I was green, creamy, supple, responsive. I swallowed your fingers, the index especially. I loved to be spread. I dried thick on glossy paper. I loved working together with you. I think you loved me too. You'd drag me a fingerful across the paper in great arcs until I'd wane. The best part, when you dip your finger again, mix me with the blue. Painting childhood aches. Now I'm old. I'm cracked. I'm dried. I'm hard. Shake me, I rattle. Caged unable to leave. I'm so useless. Why haven't you thrown me away? Shriveled and cracked past the sell-by date. Do not resuscitate. Oh, great haiku in that, Tyvin. Uh, finger paint. Thanks for sharing that, Carla. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you made it to the last minute. Great. Good to see you. Yeah, great. Yeah, Good to see you, too. Yeah, thanks, Carla. It was Finger Paint by Carla Schwartz. And that is going to wrap up um, the uh, open or the prompt lines and let's do the Saiku really quickly um, let me pull it up the Saiku is based on this article right here from uh, from Penn State University let me get it small enough so you can fit on the screen here okay so this is the article backyard insect inspires invisibility devices next gen tech and so um, leaf hoppers um, are really interesting little they're similar to grasshoppers they're uh, but they're smaller and they eat the the nectar and the juice from plants and not actually chew anything which is a little i didn't really know that but they're like half the size of grasshoppers are pretty small but what's interesting about them is they secrete these things called brocosomes which are little uh little little pieces of um matter that are shaped like soccer balls they're super tiny little soccer balls and no one really knew what they were for and there were a lot of different theories about it but there's a new theory and based on this team of researchers at penn state that um that created a, a, a um using 
biomedical engineering created a sort of a larger version of it and then studied it. And it turns out that they absorb a lot of both visible and ultraviolet light, decreasing the amount of um, light that's reflected by up to 94%. And so it's almost like you could use this as like an invisibility cloak or something like that. Could also be used um, to make solar panels more, um, um, more useful or, or more um, absorbent. And so using the shape in a nanoparticle might be something that we have in the future, a lot of uses in the future. And this was my uh, Saiku that was inspired by that little science story right here. Daydreaming in the backyard, invisibility cloak. Daydreaming in the backyard, invisibility cloak. That is my Saiku for this week. And that is the show for this week. Let's swing back to Katie Dozier, our prompt poems editor. Hey, Katie. Hi, I loved hearing everyone's poems tonight. It was so fun to get a peek into so many people's childhoods. Yeah, it definitely was. And I, I knew it was going to be a fun prompt. And, and we really, it came through with everybody's stories and their childhood memories. I, I like it when poems go in that direction. It's kind of a, a positive, happy kind of episode for the most part. That may have been part of why we picked that particular <laughs> prompt. But don't tell anybody, okay? Yeah, well, I'm not going to tell anybody. It's just me and you on the Zoom. Just us on the Zoom. <laughs> so, uh, so what is next week's prompt going to be? Do you do you remember and have it written down? I think it's short enough that I remember it. Okay. So I believe it is to write a poem that is set in spring and includes personification. So you can go wherever, whatever you want to personify, you can go with. Let's see. We'll, so. we'll pull it up and see if you were right. And it's you even... were. <laughs> write right. a poem that been set in spring <laughs> that includes personification. Um, mm -hmm. So that should be another interesting one. Um, you know, what would you want to personify about spring, the setting? A lot of ways to go. A pretty open-ended one. And that will be, we should say, the first April prompt poem of the month because next show is the first April show. So mm -hmm. th that was not going to be included in the, um, in the, in the submittable um, mm -hmm. listings until, you know, several days after April. So even though the show is coming up April 1st, you have to wait a bit to submit it. Uh, but it should be... A lot of fun seeing those poems, the good poems for uh, the first day of spring, which was just a few days ago. That is true. And I should also say, as I get into um, reading everybody's poems and everything for this month, uh, I'm not going to have time to do as many personalized rejections this month. So please don't take it personally. I'm also doing uh, the anthology for one art, the haiku anthology. So I'm, I'm fielding a lot of submissions. And then of course we have Easter smack at the end of the month too. Yeah. That's a big deadline. You know, that, uh, yeah, <laughs> that a lot of deadlines, a lot of eggs. Yes. Yeah. A lot of stuff going on, uh, that mm -hmm. Sunday. So, um, but, but do, you know, if you want to sh submit poems too, haiku to Katie, you still can and give her more work <laughs> by going yeah, please to, do. is it one art poetry? Is that his web? What is his website? Oh gosh. Now I feel awful. <laughs> oh. No, 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 no. It's one I'll type it's one one art. Where's the actual URL? One. Every time I need to find it, I just Google one no, art. I was right. I was totally right. I just doubted myself. Okay. It's oneartpoetry.com. Oneartpoetry.com, yeah. yeah. And the submission um stuff is in my link tree, which is on my Twitter if you want to just see it's just an email address for submitting and I, I am glad that a lot of rattlers have submitted their haiku to me and there have been many that are really good so it's going to be very challenging there too well that's a lot of fun and then we're gonna have the poetry space back after a week off too yes. uh, talking about the flow state which is my uh, yeah. one of my favorite topic maybe in the poetry i think that's what it's all about really and so it's gonna be fun to talk to uh, bob hickok once again for that episode coming up it'll drop on friday along with a critique of the week yeah, I'm really excited because in the episode um, where you interviewed him, you've had him on twice, obviously, as you know. <laughs> but in 222, you guys like edged on talking about the flow state some and everything. And I think he is the perfect poet to talk about the flow state with. So I'm really excited. So that episode will be out on Friday of the Poetry Space. And I'm super excited about it. Yeah, well, that's gonna be a lot of fun. You find that just on any podcast catcher, just type in the Poetry Space or whatever. But yeah, yeah, looking forward to that and everything. Thanks for all you do, Katie. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for all you do, Timothy Green. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, that is the show for this week. We're going to wrap it up. And um, next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be uh, Doug Ramsbeck. And Doug is just a great poet, another one that I've always been curious about. Um, I know he's sort of Ohio-ish based and um, writes a lot of rural topics. Um, really interesting and beautiful poems that he's done. Um, his, I think, I don't know, fifth book maybe, if I remember right, is uh, Blur, which just came out. Um, 
a wonderful poet. He's in the spring issue of Rattle as well. That's Doug Ramsbeck, Rattlecast number 239. Uh, next week, Monday, April 1st, uh, the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, with your uh, your poems a set in spring, including personification. So interesting. Uh, there, pull up, uh, pull up your poems and join us for Rattlecast number 239. Hope you have a great week in the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Good night.